As we start here in lesson 23 in your notes, uh, we're starting in chapter 22. I want to explain something to you that has been trouble for even seminary students to understand, especially those of us who are here in America and other places where our day starts at midnight. But in many other countries and in the time of our scripture, day start, the, the new day started at 6 o'clock at night. So I want to show you this little chart that I've made here. In the week before Calvary, the week before Calvary, at 6 p.m. every evening, the new day starts, even though it's night. The sun's going down. And throughout your Bible, you always see it written night and day. Night and day. Well, for us, our day starts at midnight. So we have part of a night, then all the day, and then part of a night, and then the new day starts in the middle of our sleep. Uh, some of us should be sleeping, but most of you are not, because I watch your emails going and coming, what time you're up, and you're posting on Facebook, and you ought to be resting and going asleep, but you cannot sleep because you're bothered. So we all might as well just do Bible study together, you know, just, uh, I wish we could do it long distance, and it won't be long before we can all crowd up and do it long distance or by the by iPads. Anyway, uh, Sunday afternoon happens, but at 6 p.m. it becomes Monday. Monday goes up, and at 6 p.m. it becomes Tuesday. Same all the way down. Tuesday becomes Wednesday at 6 p.m. When we would be coming to church uh, here on, um, on uh, Wednesday, when we'd come here Wednesday at 6 o'clock, when we arrive at church, you know, we come here on Wednesday at 4.30 to eat supper, and at 6 o'clock, if we were in biblical times, we would be starting Thursday. You see what I'm saying? And we come on down. This has called, caused great difficulty in people dating and timing. In fact, because of this, people have tried to say, oh, Jesus wasn't crucified on Friday and the Passover really didn't happen on, on Thursday. It happened on this day because you can't get this day and that day. Just take it at my word. This is how it is. This is how it is. As we pick up here in chapter 22, verse 1, it says, now the feast of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. All right. The feast of unleavened bread. I, 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 this is a translation, a wording that is a little uh, rigid. Actually, it should say, should say it like this. this. Now the feast of unleavened bread, which begins with Passover. Passover is the first day, and then unleavened bread continues for seven days after that. It's the feast of unleavened bread for seven days after the Passover. Let's pick back up here on our little chart. Uh, we ended chapter 21 at the end of the day on Tuesday. As Jesus at 6 o'clock is headed back to the Mount of Olivet and really over to Bethany to spend the night with Laz Martha, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. That starts on Wednesday. All day Wednesday... They are, he is in Bethany. He does not come back to the temple. All day Thursday, he's in Bethany. He does not come back to the temple. He is going to arrive over in Jerusalem shortly before 6 o'clock, and he is going to go into an upper room where they are going to consume the Passover meal after 6 o'clock, which is really their day Sorry, started for Friday. It's very important. They have missed some things. The Passover is approaching, and um, they are they are going to, they're going to miss some things that they're supposed to have done. One of the things they were supposed to have done, which we'll get to in just a minute, was they were supposed to have killed a lamb on twi at twilight on the morning, which would be Thursday morning, and roasted it all day long. They've missed that because they don't have a lamb. Four days earlier, on the first day of the week on this calendar, they were supposed to have selected a lamb. They haven't selected a lamb. They're supposed to select the lamb. They're supposed to fatten that lamb up and then kill it on the day and roast it all day long for them to celebrate the meal and eat all the meal that night before midnight. Have to eat it before midnight. They have to consume every bit of it before midnight, by the way. But they really have selected a lamb because Jesus has entered in the triumphal entry on the colt, and everyone has said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
they really have selected the lamb. In the afternoon, after lunch, they've selected the lamb on Sunday, and he's going to go back on home. Well, it says here in Luke, it's all that Paul knows about what's going on. This is Paul's testimony, remember. Paul says, now the Feast of Unleavened Bread is about to happen, which is called the Fat Passover, and it's approaching. <clears throat> now the Passover began in Egypt. You know the story of the ten plagues. Nine plagues have passed. And the Lord says to Moses, Moses, tell everybody on the first day of the week to select a lamb. Select a lamb. Actually, they told him the tenth day of, uh, of Nisan to select a lamb. Tenth day of Nisan on the calendar, select a lamb. Whatever day it falls on. It just, just so happens when Jesus is going to be crucified, it falls on Sunday. Select a lamb the first, that, on that day. Set that lamb. That lamb is to be less than one year old. Now, I know in our Bibles it says a year old. But when our Bible was penned, and also in the time of Egypt, the concept of a zero was not in place yet. Okay? So, therefore, anything that was less than one year old, it's in its first year. You got that? We don't say one year old until you've finished your first year. You got it? So how old is, oh, it's a year and two months. Okay, how old is that child? Well, he's three months old. To them, it's a year, it's in their first year, so they call it a first year. That lamb was to be blemish free, <clears throat> less than one year old in the way we would think. One year old in the way they would think. They were selected, take it out. They were supposed to take care of it <clears throat> like a pet in their home. And then on the morning of the 14th, at twilight, twilight is when the sun, the, uh, if, you, if those of y'all who hunt, when you go out to hunt dove in the morning, you go out in the dark, and then all of a sudden you can see everything, but the sun has, top of the sun, <clears throat> has not peaked above the horizon. The time between it being daylight and you're able to move around and see everything, and the sun peaking above is called twilight. Now, <clears throat> dusk is in the evening where you can still see everything but the sun has gone below the horizon and for 30 more minutes you can still see everything it becomes darker and darker and darker twilight's in the morning dusk is at night at twilight before the sun is peaked over they were to take that lamb to put their hand on that head and cut that lamb's throat and then put that lamb skin it dress it put that lamb on a spit and ro roast that lamb. It could not be boiled. It could not be baked. All the blood in that lamb had to be cooked out of that lamb. I think it's very, very interesting <clears throat> that the thing that was to be spread over the doorpost of every house to keep the death angel from destroying the firstborn in that uh, household was the very thing that could not be part of the Passover meal. Did you catch that? In fact, we say it wrong. We sing songs that we don't even think about it. We've got favorite songs. My favorite song ever in my entire life as a kid was, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. You got it? Maybe yours too. The problem is, it's the shed blood of the lamb. The, the story of the song is not quite accurate. Because when they killed that lamb, the blood was shed out totally out of that lamb. In fact, when they would do their sacrifices, they would take it up to the table where it would be slaughtered. They would cut it. They would allow the blood would roll off that table down into these vessels. And it would roll off and the priest would take a little from each of the vessels and spread it on the horns of the brazen altar. And we talk about brazen, it means it's got a fire rolling. And those horns on each of the four corners are... Are red hot and as soon as that blood hits it it's a sound you know what we're talking about those of us who cook we understand it's the shed blood it's the shed blood of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross that it's his purpose it was the last sacrifice for your salvation now some of you may use the term I'm going to plead the blood of Jesus on this okay it was the shed blood of Jesus that brings about our salvation by our faith and trust in Him because the shed blood, what are you going to plead? The blood's gone. The animal, once it's roasted and sitting there in front of the people to eat, the blood is gone. The fat is also gone. The fat 
the extra and the blood is all gone. So on that evening there in, in, um, in Egypt, on the evening, which is now the 14th of the day, it's now Friday for all practical purposes in Egypt, that are sit down between 6 o'clock and midnight, and they are co to consume all of the lamb and all the food that's been set there. Anything that goes past midnight is going to putrefy. So they must consume it all. They must eat it all. The instruction is, is if your family is not big enough for one lamb, you're to join two or three families together so that every bit of the food could be consumed that night. And so it was for 1,505 years down to this very night in Jerusalem when Jesus is going to eat the Passover with his apostles. Uh, they have to have a borrowed lamb. The owner of the house has the lamb on the spit, roasting, when Jesus sends them to find a place to make preparations. And the lamb was selected on four days before that that homeowner, who by the way was the father, most likely, of John Mark, who wrote the book of Mark. Because when you look in the book of Mark, Mark is talking about himself as the young man who slipped away to follow them to the Garden of Gethsemane in only the sheet that he had around him. And lo and behold, when he's running away like everybody else is running away, the sheet gets caught in the bushes and he runs unblemished <laughs> back to the house. Did I handle that all right? Well, what happens on, on Wednesday? Jesus is not coming. When it says that, when it said in the end of the last chapter they were coming, they only came on Monday and Tuesday. And the, everything he says is, the people are absorbing everything that Jesus is saying. It's just falling off his lips. And the leadership who ought to be loving him is hating him more and more. And lo and behold, on Wednesday, when Jesus is tucked away over in Bethany, other things are going, everything's quiet. Judas Iscariot decides that he is going to go see these high priests. And he does so on Wednesday. So verse 2 says, the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how they might put him, a, put him to death. For they were afraid of the people. They don't want to put him to death and capture him with the people. They're afraid of the people. They think, okay, if we get rid of the leader, we will get rid of the people and they will come back to us and they'll be our followers. You remember John the Baptist started this. John the Baptist was out baptizing and everybody in town left. It didn't matter if it's a religious day or not. It didn't matter if it's a fast day or not. If John the Baptist was in the area, those Jewish leaderships could read all the scripture they wanted and do everything. They didn't have a crowd. Because the crowd was out, John the, was out with John the Baptist. And when Jesus started doing the miracles, the crowd was with Jesus, not back at the temple or the synagogues. And they were afraid of these people. So they wanted to get him, but they were afraid of the people. And Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad to and agreed to give him money, 30 pieces of silver, we found out. So he consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray him to them apart from the crowd. He knew the, the rules. They did not want to take Jesus into custody in front of the crowd. Oh, no. They had to do it secretly. They had to do it behind doors. Folks, I got news for you. Just because you have a minister who claims to be a minister or a religious person, it does not mean that that person is in a right relationship with God. In fact, I know many who have graduated from seminary who the Lord absolutely does not bless in any of the ministries they are trying to do. And finally, they go out and do secular jobs because, um, because they, the Lord has not called a people who want them to be their minister. I will also tell you this. We have to be aware of those who are in leadership positions who have been there so long and made up their own rules and their own theology and they don't preach the gospel that is in the scripture. They preach what they want to preach about the hot topic of the time. Those are also to be shunned and moved away from. There's nothing wrong with a church dying because its leadership is not teaching the truth of the Lord. There's nothing wrong with that. The very men who should have been accepted Jesus, the Lord and Savior, their Messiah, the Messiah, the Christ, 
the ones who should have been accepted him, who should have looked about back at all the promises of the Old Testament that Jesus was fulfilling. They knew them. They knew what Jesus was doing was fulfilling this and this and this, and yet it was messing up their way of doing things, and they wanted him dead. Well, whatever order and whatever rank a person is in a religious organization, they are not exempt from error. If you ever think that I am in error, you come and tell me. You come and tell me, and I will listen to you. You know that. Some of you are afraid to come talk to me. I already know that too. Don't be afraid of me. I'm promising you. Don't be afraid of me. Come, I will talk to you. And I will listen to you because I'm a person who's come to the place that says, if someone has a genuine complaint, something is truthful about that complaint. And I also know that if they're thinking it, somebody else is thinking it too. It doesn't mean I can do anything about it, but I can try. If you go to some pastor or some leader and say, Pastor, I have this concern about what's going on. And you happen to know there's another hundred people that think just like you are. And you're the only one brave enough to go to them. And they don't listen to you. Might be time to pack up bags and find another place to worship. Very important. Very important. Your ministers need to be listening to you. But if they can take you back to the Word of God and tell you why you're do they're doing what they're doing, that's a different ball game. Maybe it's now it's time for you to change your way of thinking. Oh, I think God just loves everybody. And you know, and I think God will get past this. And you know, He accept this sinner and that sinner. If God calls it a sin and says, if you do not have a relationship with him, and you're going to die in eternity go to hell, you're going to die in eternity and go to hell. It's a promise. It's a promise. Don't go away from those promises. Seek what is right in God's eyes. Get to know God so you please God. Do not please the men who are around you. Do not please the women who are around you. Do not Serve in a religion that is nothing but rules and regulations. Serve in a religion that obeys the statutes and the ordinances of God. And if he says something is wrong, it is wrong. If he says, oh, no man, anything, he means, oh, no man, anything. If he says, do not have unnatural affection for one another, he means, do not have unnatural affection for one another. And I can go down the list. We say, those are rules and regulations. No, these are the things that make him happy. And our job here on earth is to get into a relationship with the Lord so close that we make him happy. It doesn't matter what we think. It matters what he thinks. If he wants us to be baptized, we better get dunked. If he wants to take the Lord's Supper in remembrance of him, we better take the Lord's Supper in remembrance of him. And so they came on the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. And they said to him, where do you want us to prepare it? We got no idea, in other words, because they haven't made arrangements. The arrangements were started, supposed to have been, ma been made four days before. He said to them, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he enters. And you shall say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? In other words, where are you offering the lamb that has been slain and is on the spit out there being roasted to those to help you eat it. Where is that guest room? And he will show you the large furnished upper room. Furnished? What kind of preparations do they need to make when it's furnished? Prepare it there. And they left and found everything just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. So it's Thursday. they got to get over there. They get it done. they got to come back. Then they got to get over there by the evening before Passover begins. It's uh, the day at, where they're going to eat the meal after 6 o'clock. They're not prepared, but the Lord has prepared it. The Lord has everything in place. And the sun will begin to set on that Thursday and Jesus and his disciples will sit down in that upper room and they will begin to have the Passover meal just like they have had every single year for 1,505 years. And since out in the wilderness, the Lord inaugurated the Passover to be remembered of what happened the year before in Egypt. So they start there. They've got to eat all that meal before midnight. 
And when the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God, the thousand year kingdom of God here on earth. In other words, I have eaten the Passover meal with you three times already, but now this is the last time I'm going to eat it with you. This is the last time I'm going to eat it with anyone until I eat it again in the thousand-year time, the kingdom of God that is about to come. That lamb is there. It's not to be baked. It's not to be boiled. It is there. The fat has been removed. The blood has been removed. Can you imagine what it had been like 1,506 years before when the Egyptians got up and they went out and saw blood on the bloody mess on the doorpost of all these people there in the land of Goshen. Can you imagine what they thought and the doors that didn't have anything in the rest of Egypt? Where'd you get this blood? Well, we all killed a lamb this morning. Oh, we did. What's the blood up there for? That's to keep the, the plague from hitting our household. Ah, uh, what kind of plague? That death angel's going to come over and kill the firstborn child, a, a male child, oh, no, firstborn child, I'm sorry, of every household. Oh, surely not. Not going to happen. Well, let me tell you something. It happened that night. And it's happened, and they're going to remember it. That's all told. The instructions for what they were supposed to do with the Passover meal is in Exodus chapter 23, verse 18. So they're sitting down. It's time for the Passover meal. And the Lord picks up the cup. He says, and when he had taken the cup and given thanks, verse 17, he said, Take this and share it among themselves, yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. In other words, he's saying, this is the last time I'm going to do this, this uh, Passover with you. Uh, it's interesting, it's because they've never seen this before. This is not part of the Passover ritual. The Passover ritual, which we've seen in other, uh, the other Gospels, Paul doesn't include it here. Luke doesn't include it because Paul doesn't talk about it. All Paul talks about is what he's heard happen. And so Paul tells Luke, and Luke writes it here. They took this cup and said, I'm not going to drink this again. This is a new day. These apostles never saw this coming. For after the meal and the reclining and all the stories that Jesus is going to tell that are not here because Paul didn't hear them. Now they're over in the book of John because John heard them. They're in Matthew because Matthew heard some of them. But they're not here. They go straight to just the Lord's Supper. These apostles are thinking something strange. Uh, Matthew doesn't even tell us about Jesus washing their feet. I mean, uh, Luke doesn't even tell us about Jesus washing their feet because Paul wasn't there to see that. He doesn't, he doesn't hear the in interaction that's going on because this is a Pharisee's testimony of what he saw happening. So he passes it and says, oh, hmm, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you take the cup and you drink it, do it in remembrance of me until I come again. So he takes the bread and he's taken some of the bread and given thanks and he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. What an incredible statement. Do this in remembrance of me. Another place Paul says, and as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Well, the high holy days of our church is when we have the Lord's Supper, this new covenant. He taking the cup, and in the same way he took the cup after he had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood. The new covenant of my blood. This is the blood that's going to be poured out. By the 24 hours after he's doing that, he is in the grave. He's in the grave. He's telling them this new covenant that's going to be for all the people that believe in him. Oh, there's a great difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. And I've charted it out for you. And as we end, I want to just end with this. Let's compare it. Even though I did this, this is not inspired it's just taking the facts from the scripture. But it's pretty inspiring to me every time that I read it. Um, of the difference between the old covenant and new covenant. In the old covenant, gifts and sacrifices were made by those who were guilty of sin. But in the new covenant, the guiltless Christ sacrificed himself for our sin. What does that mean? It means that Christ died for you. In the Old Covenant, the focus was on the physical building where a person goes to worship. 
But in the new covenant, the focus is on the reign of Christ in the hearts of each individual believer. What does that mean? That means that God is directly involved in your life. In the old covenant, the forgiveness of sin and hope of glory was just a shadow out there that you really couldn't see. But in the new covenant, the forgiveness of sin and hope of glory is a reality because it's right there. It means that our hope and our forgiveness is not temporal but eternal. We don't have to keep sacrificing. It's done once and for all. In the old covenant, uh, there were only limited promises. But in the new covenant, there are limitless promises. What does that mean? It means that we can trust God's promise to each of us. If he promises it, it's going to happen. If it's a promise to us, if it's a promise to Israel, that's a different thing. If it's a promise to Jeremiah, that's a different thing. If it's a promise to Ezekiel, that's a different thing. If it's a promise to us and to all the people, it's a promise. In the old covenant, the people failed to keep their agreement with God, but in the new in the new covenant, Christ keeps the agreement faithfully no matter what we do. It doesn't matter what we do. What does that mean? It means that Christ has kept the agreement whereas people can or could not. In the new covenant, there were external standards and rules, but in the new covenant, there's internal standards and a new heart. By the way, you can pretty much live by your heart in the new covenant because your new heart will be God's heart because he is inside of you. The Holy Spirit is teaching you. What does that mean? That means that God sees both the actions and the motives and we are accountable to God. We're not accountable to rules and regulations. The people had limited access to God in the old covenant, but in the new covenant, we have unlimited access to to God. It means that God is personally available to you. The people in the old covenant, everything was based on fear, but the new covenant, everything is based on love and forgiveness. What does that mean? It means that forgiveness keeps our failures from destroying the agreements that we have or the agreement. In the old covenant, there was a legal cleansing. In the new covenant, there's a personal cleansing. It means that God's cleansing is complete. In the old covenant, the sacrifice was continuous. In the new covenant, Christ's death was conclu the conclusive sacrificer. It was the last one that was needed. No more shedding of blood was needed after that. It means that Christ's sacrifice was perfect and final. In the old covenant, they had to obey the rules. In the new covenant, we must serve a living God. It means that we have a relationship and not a regulation. In the old covenant, forgiveness was earned. In the new covenant, forgiveness is freely given. It means that we have true and complete forgiveness. In the old covenant, complete uh, cer the, the ceremony was repeated yearly. In the new covenant, the ceremony was completed by Christ's death on the cross. It means that Christ's death can be applied to your sins. In the old covenant, requirement was accomplished by human effort. In the new covenant, the requirement is accomplished by God's grace. It means that it is initiated by God's love for you. In the old covenant, it was available only to some, the Jews, and those who would go into Judaism. But in the new covenant, it's available to all, the entire world. It means it's available to you if you want it. It's a great difference between the old and the new covenant, even though the both were set up by the Lord on purpose to bring him, the nation of Israel, to the time where he would come to be their Savior. And they would reject it, reject him, and then it would be spread to the rest of the world. And to the rest of the world, it has spread. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time just to love each other, to share your word, and to look into what you have to say. Lord, we are thankful for the new covenant. We are thankful for the freedoms that you have given us. That in spite of our human efforts where we fail, you have completed and you keep the agreement with us when we can't keep the agreement with you. Lord, you are there to bless us and take care of us. Lord, it's not our rules that we follow, it's yours. It's not agreements that we try to keep, but you keep those. And we thank you for that in your name. Amen. Let the word of God hide in your heart that you may not sin against him. Good to see all y'all.